Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. Here we are on another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast. Uh, we've got Eric here, who uh, just won a tournament with Phobos at the No Coast Open. Yep. Hello. Thank hey. you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We had Justin on here. I think two months ago, talking about the No Coast Open out in Oklahoma. And we're here with Eric, the winner with Phobos, a team that this week on our week-to-week stat show did not do all that well. So it's interesting to see them score, maybe not the largest tournament, but still a pretty solid win over a pretty nice spread of teams. Yeah, I had thought about everything going into the game. Uh, into the into the whole event and Bobos, I know they're not anyone's you know top pick for most likely to dominate the world, but I looked at it, thought about my potential matchups, and thought it was the right call. I guess that worked out okay for me. Yeah, did you have any big matchups that you were extremely worried about? I know that Geller Pox made an appearance at the tournament, and I believe you crushed them, right? Uh, yeah, I uh, did well in my Geller Pox matchup. The the different matchup I considered, uh, Geller Pox was definitely one I was concerned about. Um, Nemesis Claw, especially when I uh, saw that Nemesis Claw was being piloted by Mr. Garrett, that gave me some pause. But I've had some experience playing Phobos into these difficult matchups and, and playing other teams into similarly lopsided matchups. And Phobos gave me the sense that I could always do something else other than get engaged directly. Um, you know, like getting caught up in melee with Geller Pox sounded awful. And I hated the idea of that. But when I looked at Phobos, I was like, I've got another plan. I can just I can just not be there when he comes charging down the down the board at me. And that's the approach I took to a lot of those hard matchups, whether it was Nemesis Claw, Geller Pox, I just made sure I wasn't where they wanted me to be. With strategies like Vanguard and uh, Elite Reconnaissance, I was able to stay out of harm's way for the most part and execute my plan. So it sounds like if you had to choose one emoji to represent your battle against the Gellerpox, it would most likely be the ghost emoji. Am I right? That is true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can go into more specifics on how I handled that if you please. I actually Uh, would love to hear all about that. Yeah, yeah, deep dive us. Get us into the headspace right. of the Phobos player the running away from Geller Pox, Nemesis, Claw, and everything else. <laughs> running away in All a right. scoring way. Yeah, yeah. So, let's see. I'm trying to recall exactly which matchup Geller Pox was. I, I believe it was an open map on Secure, because it was my second game, and the second game was Secure on the first day. So we had an open match, open map, we've got Secure, um the map was approximately octaria shaped with some non-gw terrain so just to give you the vibe there it was octarius-esque um and so looking at that you know i knew that there were going to be four huge monsters and a bunch of other much less impressive guys but uh, my focus was on those uh the big boys I realized I did not want to fight them in melee at all ever once. So I took zero Reavers in that match. I took an Infiltrator Sergeant. I took the Incursor Mine Layer and the Incursor Marksman. Um, the Infiltrators all have a lethal five up. That's a good rule for just forcing in that extra little bit of damage, of which Phobos barely do any Um in that matchup because I knew I would have to ultimately the only way I was going to avoid having um, giant monsters beat me to death was going to be by killing a couple of them. So the two incursors that I took every time and will take every time forever and ever because they're amazing. The marksman and the, and the mine layer were there. The infiltrator sergeant 
was there because well he was going to do a little bit more damage than the um the incursor sergeant and the incursor sergeant's ignoring obscuring ability just didn't look like it was going to be helpful um on that map anyway and the reaver sergeant you know he he had to stand too close to giant monsters so that was a no-go uh then from there i believe it was the medic the veteran because he does a little bit more damage than the other guys and the infiltrator saboteur i'm not a big fan of the saboteur uh to break this down for people that don't know the team uh that well you've got your infiltrators who have the omni scramble ability and lethal five up on their guns you've got the incursors who ignore obscuring and you've got the reavers who have the terror ability uh and usually uh decent melee and shooting i've never seen anyone take their bolt carbine option i brought some with me just so i could think about it and still never found a reason i would want them but anyway so the 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 incursor saboteur he lays a mine that is a single target proximity mine you walk the enemy walks within three inches of it it goes off on that enemy one time on a crit it will stop their movement that is a fantastic tool for controlling the board the infiltrator saboteur on the other hand he places a mine and it takes an action to detonate uh similar to the way that the vet guards uh demolition dude uh takes a takes an action to activate his demo charge or whatever it is uh the infiltrator saboteur is very difficult to use in my opinion in most matchups because you do not have the spare activations to be worrying about setting up your mine moving out of your own blast range and then popping it off that takes too much you've got too many other things to do and usually your enemy is too dangerous to you phobos marines are they're an elite team which makes them uh paradoxically quite squishy other people are running around with plasma guns and melta guns and all kinds of nonsense like that and any random you know imperial jerk with a four up weapon skill or ballistic skill and a plasma gun will just delete a marine every time you just assume that it's going to happen if he could see you you died so there's no time for infiltrator saboteurs in that matchup uh well at any matchup most of the time but in this matchup i was so concerned about controlling the board space so that i could keep him away from me that i was like this is what i'm going to do and so what i did was i sent out my guys my saboteur and my mine layer uh, to the to the far objectives, um, the ones I could reach that that were closer to his side of the board, and I dropped both my mines. I scored five points. He, he was going to be a little slower than I was, so I did that to position myself, and then I kind of forced him uh, with those mines, kind of down one alley, and I would omni scramble his um, closest big monster, uh, and I had four infiltrators and omni scramble for those who don't know at home uh delays the activation of a guy you do it instead of a strategic ploy in the you know strategy phase and it has to be someone visible to an infiltrator and then you delay them for a number of activations equal to the number of infiltrators you have on the board so every time i popped this off i was delaying a monster four of his activations and so i would delay the closest one and I would shoot the next closest one as close to death as I could. Uh, given that Phobos can't actually hurt anything, they shoot little pea shooters. Uh, I wasn't quite killing one in one turn, but by delaying the closest one and taking shots at that one, it gave me time to get my guys away from that closest one by, um, by moving with Vanguard, um, climbing up buildings, and just trying to just scatter and having the uh saboteur's mind and the infiltrator's mind to kind of slow them down and, and direct them and so i was able to to lock down and then pick off one monster at a time and the the other little guys and the bugs they weren't they weren't a serious threat um some operatives took some damage uh throughout that but i was able to keep the big guys off me and score my points by controlling the board and locking them down with uh, Omni Scramble. That makes a lot of sense. If it made any more sense, we'd have to report it to the IRS. Mm, mm, mm. 
<laughs> so anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds great. Uh, Omni Scramble is super cool and interesting, and I like it. Uh, and it sounds great. Like, how many, like, Phobos Marines did you lose in that matchup? Were you kind of just kiting him so hard you didn't even lose anyone? Uh, yeah, one went down, and I had another, you know, my my goal of staying out of melee that did not go perfectly it just needed to work most of the time for me to score those points and and take it away uh i did have an operative go down another operative get badly injured uh between some uh the the big monster that has the flamethrower coming out of the gut he he got me uh, a couple times with that and then the one with the big blade arm and the tentacles i forget what his name is because they've all got names that's super cool but who am I to remember them? Anyway, he killed the dude. That was sad for him. But by and large, the other four operatives were safe and secure, racking up points, uh, shooting little bugs sometimes, whatever they needed to do. That's fantastic. So you really just played keep away against the Gellerpox Hulk on open where they couldn't really catch up with you, not in mass, because you would stun them and then run away from them while taking pot shots. So were you prioritizing killing all the little bugs in this matchup? Uh, I was prioritizing killing the big guys, um, dealing with the hulks and keeping them away. Um, I ended up because of the way that they came down the little channel I created for them. There was a guy, um, kind of off by himself, not part of the main combat who did end up, uh, rolling up on, uh, mites and glitzling and things like that. And bolter disciplining a few of them down those guys were were not a credible threat to a marine um you know anybody with a plasma gun of whom there are just so many is a threat but if you can only pull off three or four damage i'm going to stick around and bolter discipline you for quite a while before you get me yeah um did you have any games throughout that run where you came across a team with uh like goons with plasma or like what were your other matchups uh let's see my first matchup was against uh, Harnkin Jaegers. My second was against that Geller Pox player. My third was against Wyrmblade. My fourth against uh, Nemesis Claw. And my fifth against Blades of Cain. Uh, so it was a relatively plasma light event, which probably helped me out a bunch. The uh, Jaegers, of course, have some uh, surprisingly high damage. Um, yeah attacks overall but they are not usually rocking a bunch of like ap2 attacks which is just brutal into elites i've had the opportunity to be very surprised by how badly a dwarf can hurt you in several practice games so i'd gotten accustomed to what they might do to me and i hid from it and shot them from a advantageous position the of course nemesis claw player um he's got a heavy gunner he's got a regular gunner uh he was running a melt the gun which you know it was on an into the dark map so that was a fine choice for him he got some mileage out of that and the heavy bolter uh ap1 isn't half as bad as ap2 but when you shoot it twice the target's going to die and and i did and it was sad um i was able to avoid having the weirm blade players um best weapons connect with me fortunately and so we were we got a little lucky in terms of matchups on that and i was able to avoid a lot of the people that were coming at me uh, when i did face those dangerous weapons i mean there's nothing wrong with getting a little bit lucky you know for anyone who plays in tournaments we're playing a dice game and getting lucky is always part of one of those runs like you know yeah, might, yeah. Not everyone might be playing a good meta team but getting a little bit of luck on your side and knowing when to go look for luck is definitely part of the good tournament play experience right because if you're ahead you don't need to take as many risks but if you're behind you do need to know when to go roll some dice did you have any of those situations maybe against nemesis claw it sounds like since you're playing an elite versus elite matchup and they get to have a couple more activations did you have to find a line where you had to roll some dice where you didn't want to yeah the i think that's fairly true you know player skill uh, accounts for so much but there are so many good players out there the player that's going to win any given event is going to be lucky and good and you've got to have both on that day in order to make it work 
Otherwise, a player who is just as good as you and a tiny bit luckier is going to pull it out. And that's always what we're looking at. You've got to have both of those aspects going for you on that day. And you've got to also understand on like an emotional and psychological level that you need that too. And that uh, dice going bad, you know, shouldn't tilt you because you need to have your understanding of the probabilities baked into that. And you need to also understand that rolling hot doesn't mean you're a good player. I think all that's important to kind of humility that um, a lot of people who exceeded a high level master and a lot of people who kind of struggle in their games haven't quite gotten yet. There's an emotional reaction to luck that um, you've got to manage for yourself. But to the question of uh, when I relied on luck, the the rolls into the Nemesis Claw matchup were probably the ones where I was most concerned. The game there, I ended up having a situation where he was pretty widely distributed across an into the dark board, and I'd managed to uh, redeploy my guys onto one side for the most part. And so I was uh, trying to be asymmetric against him, but the angle that ended up being the easiest for me to attack had his screecher who is a melee powerhouse and his leader who is nearly invincible uh, after you account for the uh, damage negating effects of his prescience tokens that he can use once per turn i ended up against him and man uh i i killed the screecher because he came charging at me and i was able to get a couple shots off and then counter charge and kill him But then I had to go into a room that was being guarded by the visionary. My other options were dealing with the four other angry chaos space Marines in those other rooms. I surely wasn't going out there. That was going to be bad. So I had to go fight that visionary. I had to have him blank my damage. And of course, I don't have any high AP weapons. He's got three defense dice saving on threes and ignoring a damage of his choice with the prescience ability. I spent, I remember the first turn I engaged him, it was turn two. I hit bolter discipline and deadly shots. I think I used deadly shots and dumped like three Marines worth of shooting into him. And he took like three damage. Oh, no. He spun up, he hit a, you know, he hit one of my Marines with his plasma pistol. He rolled two crits. I, he rolled two crits at a hit. I saved one, and then I was just taking the two crits. Uh, fortunately, uh, transhuman physiology, um, ba- the only tactical ploy that Phobos have, <laughs> um, effectively left me with uh, 11 wounds. So I, I narrowly survived. So just facing into the inability to fight that guy um, on the turn when I thought it mattered most, and then narrowly scraping out um, the the preservation of that body, that was real critical. And at that point, you know, I felt all the negativity of having my dice go so poorly, and that really could have you know, that really could have tilted me. I was I was tempted to make poorer decisions after that experience, but I kind of maintained my discipline and it's like, oh, I'm just going to play this game. I'm going to uh, assume average dice rolls play conservatively and make it happen. I was able to take down uh, the visionary on the next turn on turning point three and then lock down those portions of the room. And then everything else was... Uh, pretty tense as some shooting uh, some shooting went down as we tried to jockey over those last few points. And again, everything felt so real because we were so close. Every, every good roll felt like it was going to be the game winner. Every bad roll felt like it was going to cost me that game. Uh, but I stayed disciplined and we tied. So tense stuff. Great game all the way around. What was one of those decisions that you were tempted to go use the tilt on that you held back from? Yeah, yeah, let's see. Because I know that I've definitely been in situations where I feel like my back is against the wall and I need to make some sort of play 
because generally I'm playing teams that are shooty teams that are a little bit squishier. So if I don't make those plays, it's going to be hard for me to disengage from Marines or other large things. So I've generally erred on the side of going for a play to clean things up rather than going for a tie. So I'm curious what decision point you bumped into where you felt this thing because you remember, you know, deciding to play a safer game plan instead of going for a bigger play. Yeah, so so at toward the end of the third turning point, you know, I had sectioned off uh, a room where I'd killed all his operatives on that side of the board. Um, and I had three guys still standing over there. He started pushing at me with a with his melt gunner and his ventrilocar. His skin thief and his heavy gunner were a little further behind, but positioning had put those two, the melt gunner and ventrilocar, up close. And I was playing. Oh, let's see. It was recover item, secure unexplored room and plant transponder as my TAC ops. Uh, there was no way I was going to get more than one point on secure unexplored room because the room where I had been fighting that whole game was one of them, and the other was way deep onto his side of the board at this point, so there was no way I was getting over there. Uh, but I had not played, I had not placed either transponder for plant transponder yet. I was deep into his deployment or his uh, drop zone, his side of the board, because we had essentially traded sides of the board at this point. And so the, the dilemma was I can spend, I can move um, out of, pos- out of go- a good combat position a little deeper. So I'm a little safer when I drop these p- transponder tokens, which I've got to do in both turn three and have a guy still alive to do it in turn four, or I can fight him. And I, I did the mental math and the gut check that goes with it. And I was like, if I, if I spend my turn fighting him, I will be more able to make sure he I've got a I've got a narrower chance of succeeding in that in that conflict because my whole theory going into this, uh, into like all my games, is that Phobos aren't going to win straight up fights. That's not what they're here for. They don't do enough damage, they don't take enough hits to do that. So it's like if I if I deviate from my doctrine here, I might be able to win it. And if I do then i'm more likely to win the game but the chance that i can beat these guys i know it's not favorable my gut tells me to go for it pop bolter discipline and just spam bolter shots but i maintain my to maintain my plan and i go for those transponders it allows me i still get a shot off on the ventrilocar i still um you know hurt the melta gunner but I'm not committed to that fight in a way that will let me kill those guys. And so I go score my points and that gets me that tie. Um, The way it actually went down, I think I made the right play. The one of the key things that happened there that that made a tie. So I had three. It was on loot. I had three objectives within range of my operatives so I could get my three points that turn. I was up by one on primary. So just maintaining the status quo and keeping it even would deliver me a victory because we were looking pretty even on secondaries too at the time. I had my reaver sergeant uh, roll in. Uh, he he moved or he, he dashed, scored, a, he looted a point and then he moved and his movement carried him on to an objective that was occupied by the ventrilocar. The ventrilocar is an icon bearer type unit, so it has plus one APL for the purpose of controlling objectives, right? So he had an effective four, and I had an effective three. I hit terror, which of course reduces effective APL for objective control, so we were tied. And uh, my next plan, my hope, was that I would be able to get another operative onto that objective on my next activation, score it put three points in primary and probably take the game away. But he uh, quite wisely realized that all he had to do was activate the ventrilocar, use its corrupting whispers ability or whatever that's called. And he just moved my reaver off of the objective. He had, he had, he had been thinking about using that dash to, to bully my helix adept earlier, but he didn't. And 
So if that had gone a little bit different, that would have made all the difference. And so uh, considering that, if I had gone to fight him, the ventrilocar's ability to pull that off uh, very easily could have put another operative out of position uh, on my side, given him that point and allowed him to kill me all the better. So that's a long way of saying, I think that if I had decided to get uh, to to stop being frosty and and get combative about it, I think the ventrilocar uh, would have would have wrecked all my plans. That's pretty gnarly. Uh, that's a way different way than I play Phobos. Uh, it's fun to hear. Uh, it's it's I like it. A proper sneaky marine, because Jason's always out here doing pure ultra violence, giving up on scoring and just running into his opponent's drop zones. Yeah, I do uh, all engage orders all the time, all in cursors. And somehow he's doing well in his local tournaments. I don't know what's going on. And I uh, well, did well at Adepticon, too. It's just... Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yep. Jason's been crushing it. Turns out the ultraviolence is a strategy, but maybe not always the best one. Because, you know, Jason, you know, being all engaged does incur a little bit of risk. Maybe if you can mix <laughs> up the uh, the two play styles, Jason, play sneaky against the Geller Pox and these AP2 weaponry, you've got a, an easier shot. No, I'm not scared of Geller Pox with that one. You just keep shooting them. Oh, yeah. In my game against Geller Pox, everyone was on gauge all the time. That wasn't even a question. Um, I did find a lot of value, though, in keeping, you know, the operatives I knew were going to run forward. Uh, usually the incursor mine layer, he was going to be on engage because he needed to be or on conceal because he needed to be safe. But there was just so much value in, like, having a couple of guys, two, three, uh, stand on engage just a little bit behind a wall just to make my opponent think about whether or not he wanted to take a bunch of free damage. Um, yeah, and overwatch and all that. Yeah, yeah. There is... Uh, the thing I love about Kill Team is that each team has enough depth and complexity that... And each matchup is so different. Each map, each mission is so unique that there is very little wrong way to do it there's there's so many ways to play each team and so many different ways to get at your goal as long as you have a plan you can probably make that plan work yeah that's true having a plan is huge and it feels like you know of the people that i've talked to as of late you've definitely got a pretty strong plan before you even get to these tournaments i spend a lot of time uh doing narrative play and so that gives me the opportunity to think about these wild missions. You know, um, if you've read through the missions available in like the in the narrative spec op stuff, some of them are just nonsense, and they really will end up not working the way you think they should. Uh, some of them are very well designed. Some of them are rather poorly designed. I feel like maybe that's just uh, me being bad. But by doing that, and and thinking about man. How will I do this? I think it really shakes your brain up and lets you consider things from different perspectives than just saying, well, how do I loot? How do I secure? How do I capture? Um, I love the match play missions and the overall structure of that system, but having to pull off some of the nonsense in the narrative missions and figure out how you're going to do that, I think gives you an appreciation and a little bit more outside the box thinking than. Um, focusing solely on the match play missions, which can be fairly mathematical. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't know how many people have actually looked into some of the narrative missions, but Octarius always is an easy one to point out because there is a mission where half your team comes in one operative at a time and defending a fort with half your team is definitely much harder than a normal game of kill team. <laughs> right, right. And meanwhile, you know, on some of the in the dark matchups, there's escape pods that you're running over as parts of the in the dark space hulk start venting so parts of the map explode and you take mortals and you gotta run and the doors shut on you and all this other crazy stuff so being able to think on your feet definitely is a thing that people who play a lot of narrative might get to do that normal match play players don't yeah definitely true do you do you normally play phobos in those narrative games or do you have other teams that you like to think about things in strange ways that you might want to shout out to some of our podcast listeners 
yeah, so I play a variety of teams. I think it's also important to do that because, you know, like I play Blooded as one of my other major teams, and and they just play so differently. And the things that scare me as a Phobos player are absolutely not the things that scare me as a Blooded player. And so when I experience what bothers me in each matchup, what I'm concerned about, I uh, assume that at least to some degree, when I'm playing against an opponent playing that team or a team like that, you know, Vet Guard is similar enough to Blooded that I imagine what bothers a Vet Guard player is the same thing that bothers me as a Phobos player. I can, or as a Blooded player, I can lean into that thing. I'm like, well, I think they're scared of this, so I'm going to do it. Uh, to the best of my ability. So I think that there's a lot of benefit to playing multiple teams. I don't think I have any uh, deep or novel insight. Um, many people have played blood or blooded better than I have. Um, I really enjoy the way the different operatives there interact with each other and how each has its function and making that function manifest itself in the reality of the game is part of the whole puzzle. Um, I found that I, I really like a defensive play with Technomancers and Hyrotech Circle. Um, I know that the fashion for a good long while for many players was after the balance updates that put them on the map was to rely on, um, you know, the Chronomancer Alpha Strike and the fact that he would just get up with nearly full health and be just as hard to kill again. Um, but I was playing them before they got those updates and and found a slower plotting style with the Technomancer's backup to keep your guys up and alive was beneficial. I know that a lot of people have uh, not been playing Pyrotech since they were rebalanced. And so I've been considering trying to get back there and see if I can't make some magic happen with my uh, relatively unique approach, I guess, to that. But you know, I could only take one team to the no coast open. Sadly, that's that's my great uh, regret in all of this is that I can't play enough kill team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Technomancer definitely would be a uh, a fun and hip way to play that no one no one's talking about. No one's you know <laughs> you'd get to yeah, uh, true. be unique there. I think that the Technomancer now, because of all the changes, might actually be one of the better ones. To be fair, maybe higher tech are just not that good because when you get up now, it's so likely that you just instantly die. But the Technomancer does let you get up at more health, lets you get up more times, lets you be a little bit slower and play that security game plan. But who knows? We do have the new edition swinging around and it does sound like right. lots of things are changing. You have any big plans with the uh, Hive Storm coming up and what they've teased so far? You know, as of the time of recording this podcast, we've got some teasers on brand new ways of doing equipment. I think they've implied at this point that maybe equipment is not locked per operative just from how the Vespid equipment is shown because it describes like any operative during a turning point and not specific operatives. So maybe it is the case that Higher Tech Circle will get a big glow up because equipment has changed because right now equipment is kind of boring on higher tech like if everyone could have bayonets for one equipment choice that would be kind of wild yeah i am really excited to see what is coming with the new edition i do not follow like particular i do not follow new editions and their releases with the specificity of like oh tell me about this rule let me let me find out how this minutia has changed uh, I look for the the broader pictures. The most exciting news so far was that the teams I love and have already built and painted are not getting sent to Legends. I'm sure we're all aware of uh, um, unreliable looking and ill-founded rumors that all of our stuff was going to get thrown into the dumpster. I'm glad to see that that does not appear to be the case, and I am pretty pumped um, that my precious Phobos and Blooded guys are going to be around for the edition. Uh, that said... I really like the way that the new equipment stuff looks like it's going to work. Um, certainly having equipment be, you know, team wide or something creates some fascinating opportunities because, I mean, I can't think of how many times I put like a grenade on some guy or some other piece of equipment that I thought could have been cool. And that guy just died and there was no one, any, there was no way anyone was going to do anything about it. Um, or, 
as has happened plenty often. I forget that that was the guy that had the thing. And well, the time has passed. I didn't get to do the cool thing with the cool equipment. If it's more broadly applicable, there'll be more opportunities to do the cool thing. I'll feel like a cool guy doing it. The real big thing I like, though, is that the barricades, and it looks like there are heavy barricades, and there are those barbed wire pieces. Uh, if those, as they appear to be, are equipment that you can take, I think it can really change the game in a lot of good ways for a lot of teams. You know, how many times have you been on a like a sparse board with a melee team or a melee-ish team, and your opponent is like a Pathfinders player with a bunch of vantage points? Like, you just, you don't have a game there, you're just going to die, and it's going to be sad, and you're going to feel bad. There are some teams that just struggle on some maps against certain other matchups. But if I can be like, well, my Felgor have to get all the way over there, I can put heavy terrain wherever I want it. At least I've got that shot at getting that guy across the board to do the thing I want to do. I like the dynamic looking nature of that and how it might let me uh, plan better and adapt to different matchups and different map. Um, I'm also excited for just seeing how they re-envision some of the basic rules. Like, you know, I think about Blooded and all their equipment is bad and most of their ploys are bad. Uh, you know, if you're playing Blooded, you're spending a lot of CP just on command reroll because like, what else you got? And yeah, Sarah Boyd's card are in the same boat, you know, as it's it's a big thing that they could make a huge adjustment for for this next edition since it seems like it's going to be way more of a an upgrade rather than just a clean new edition yeah yeah and you know of course everybody like all the early elite teams have like one cp strat ploy fight twice one cp strat ploy shoot twice if they combine those like they did in the later teams then that theoretically leaves room for a whole new strat ploy what do they do with that it'll be cool feeling like you have abilities that do things. I don't know what it'll be doing and if it'll be good, but it'll be neat. It'll be new. And I think I'll like that. Oh, man. I mean, like, Phobos already has the uh, balance status late extra ploy that... So, I mean, they could just, like, put the shoot twice, fight twice into one ploy and deadly shots comes down. That'd be a pretty big upgrade for Phobos, actually. Double fight, double shoot, and deadly shot all in one bucket. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that would be... Phobos' <laughs> identity is just, we put all of our rules on our strap ploy. <laughs> it's just what we do every right. time. I mean, with if Phobos had the shoot twice, fight twice locked into one thing, I think I would try all Reavers, just because like you've got that flexibility. You can charge and fight someone. If you fail to kill him, you can fight again and fix it. And like you want to shoot twice a lot, and but like you don't paying two CP to have that is like two CP hungry. But for one, sign me up. Yeah, yeah. And what's the tactic? There's I don't even remember the name of it. I'm looking up now the Phobos tactical ploy that um, one step ahead for one CP. You can tr when after they've revealed their team, you can trade out one of your operatives for a different operative. Nobody has ever done that. Nobody ever would do that. That is just so like mind-numbingly useless. That could be that could be anything, you know. It's a whole new world. It is definitely too cute by half, I think, most of the time. And also, I believe the biggest problem with the Phobos that ploy specifically is there's just not enough toys in the Phobos toolkit where you're you look at the board and you're like, well, I have the seventh tool that I can mind game with, because the mind game is not worth enough. Yeah. Yeah. Plus yeah. you're like super and... duper CP hungry. Um you you can't afford to like you just want to make the right choice in the first place and don't even bother with the mind games because there's already so much like crazy stuff that you're gonna want to pull off in the middle of the game that you don't want to just juke somebody out, but not really, and spend a CP on it. <laughs> yeah, because of course uh your opponent knows what they are most afraid of you having picked. And so they have prepared themselves for whatever they were most worried about. So if you brought something suboptimal and then you realize it and then spend the CP to put in the thing they have already prepared for, well, that's not, you know, that's not efficient. That's, that's, you need that CP later and you need to have made the right choice the first time. And I'm sure that, you know, there are so many teams and they're all so cool and I couldn't begin to know half of them as well as, as I should like. But I know that everybody else and their pet team is like, yeah, this ploy, this piece of equipment, this this is dumb. 
And so everybody has a chance to like gain something cool from just the the shake up and the re envisioning and reimagining of the teams. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to see some some fresh uh, some fresh faction rules. Uh, definitely excited about that. I'm curious of to hear uh, both of your opinions when it comes to the new teams. Are you thinking about playing either one of them or not so excited about the new teams? What what are we feeling? For, for my part, I am excited to see them. I probably won't um, won't make any of them my main team anytime soon. Uh, because I also play Big Hammer, and I have a Chaos Space Marine Army, a Space Marine Army, a Necron Army, and so like all of my teams generally are teams that like fall under those umbrellas, like that I could play in Big Hammer. I probably won't, but I could. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I mean, I've been waiting for Vespid for God knows how long. I started playing when I was like 16, and the Vespid models are, have been the same until you know now when I'm the ripe old age of. 34 so i'm pretty excited to play vespid and the rules kind of slap they previewed the neutron grenade launcher i think yesterday as the time of recording and if you read the rules and really synthesize what it's doing it is four attacks on fours effectively four floor damage all the way up to six or it's basically four six damage floor and then you add an extra maybe up to two damage on either end which to me is crazy because you shoot, you drop a token. That token says uh, when your opponent next activates that model, they take a guaranteed D, uh, D3 wounds. And a crit deals an extra two. So it just reads like an insane gun, especially because the Vespid all have fly. And if we get 10 models, uh, two APL that all fly, even though they've got this extra rule that says, you know, you've got to give these communion points to shoot close targets. Pretty sure that on a 30 by 22, if I move six inches, I can generally get within eight inches of the target I want to shoot anyways. And who cares at that point? Yeah, eight inches is is kind of a long ways. Um, you can reach yeah, a lot with that, especially when you up, fly. Yeah, not mattering as much as maybe the designers think. But if that's one of the guns and we still get a rail rifle and I still get some stealth operative, you know, maybe this version of Kill Team is just way more killy. I think in the original 30 minute teaser they did on twitch i think there was a clip of one of the new mission types that was a kill tally so it might be that this edition of kill team just involves way more killing than the last two years of competitive kill team involved where it was a lot of touching buttons and hiding yeah yeah Uh, if the mission is just kill stuff and choose if that like replaces if a primary which is i mean i don't know if it 100 percent replaces the primary but if it does then this is just all the more reason for me to uh, just sprint out into the open with a bunch of space marines on engage and murder everybody. That sounds pretty exciting. Not gonna lie. Yeah, I am pumped about that being an option. I I like how different the new teams are, and I like how different the new missions, like the kill op and things like that. I don't fully understand how all that interplays i don't think we're meant to understand it yet i think they've got a few more articles to torture us with before we get there but it's all unique and different and that is so cool you know the fact yeah. like it should be the case that marines can start on engage and go around butchering their enemies that should be an option that should, that is cool that's something they should be able to do and so making that possible where it wasn't before is definitely a laudable design goal i think yeah yeah i, I think mean the, for uh, all the listeners of the podcast jason has been doing that for the better part of the entire time of our podcast yeah if that becomes <laughs> the new meta um i'll have a big head start um yeah when it comes to the the box i think those new um I already forgot what they called them, but the the, the I'm going to call them scions because they look like scions. Uh, the jump pack scions, the uh, aquilons, aquilons, those guys. Or yeah, those yeah. guys look tight, and the fact that one of them can drop like orbital drop directly into someone's neck is hilarious and sounds incredibly rude. Yeah, the the physics on that, just kind of imagining how that would really work, uh, is pretty funny to me. It's like it's big, like Assassin's Creed vibes. Just like jump off of a tall place and put a knife in somebody. Yep. The haystack is someone's jugular. Exactly. (laughs) 
I think in the previews for their rules, they mentioned at this point now that there are four tokens and you or I don't know how big the team is. They said a third of the team starts off as tokens. So maybe kind of like the Gene Stealer cult tokens in 40K that can move around. But this time they like shift four and as you basically you can elect to drop a dude in. And I assume you would probably use up your normal move in doing so. So maybe you just drop and then you can go do a thing. Yeah, And then it's like, do they drop it during the turning point or do they drop like in the strat- strategic phase we don't know uh still lots of wiggle room there because i mean if you drop into engagement range with the precursor and it's during the strategic phase mm, maybe not the strongest ability in the world but if it's like your activation and then you drop down and nuke somebody that's going to be really really strong yeah free violence is always then that optionality it's always going to be good stuff yeah, it's just like a strong non-reciprocal first strike where like you guaranteed know that your heavy hitter is going to hit someone before you the enemy hits them back. I kind of suspect that the break point on the damage, just considering how all the other boxes have been designed, is that the two teams will make sense against each other. So it might be that the precursor is only doing four or five damage, kind of like a chainsword in current or edition. Like three, so five. even when it uh yeah four five uh basically so when it or three five yeah it could be something like that so when it drops out of the sky it's never kill it or it's not guaranteed to kill a vespid on the way in because the vespids in the preview they show them at nine wounds which i was not expecting as far as you know what a tau stat line would look like although i guess technically they're not tau they're they're bugs yeah they i wouldn't expect them to be uh, significantly sturdier than elves but hey what do i know about vespids yes they are um, I feel like if I was going to come up with a nickname nickname for the Vespids, I would call them Flappy Rude Boys. That seems right. That seems. Yeah. That speaks to my soul. I am looking forward to being very rude. It's <laughs> a good goal to have. Yeah, I think they even called out that Fly is basically being reworked in that it effectively is just teleporting now. <laughs> There's not even... I think they... In the article, they mentioned that you just pick up the model and just place it, replace it within X inches of where you started. So you just there's not even a mention of terrain anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the one question that I guess sort of remains there is, do they count vertical movement? Like, are we doing like a diagonal thing? Like, if it's like, OK, pick you up uh, six inches diagonally is on top of this vantage. Or do we just ignore verticality and be like, I pick them up. I move six inches vertically. I'm up on the thing steals a little bit of extra if you remember how pythagorean pythagorean you that guy and his theorem yeah maybe <laughs> maybe it's a little bit of a nerf but it might just be you know now they're all mandrakes which sounds really they're crazy just jumping around doing the thing but i Buzzing, mean if it's, getting if it's, the p1 yeah it says it's specifically called that you can't charge from fly you still have to charge like on the ground to do that i'm happy about that i Me one too. of my regular opponents is a harlequins player and man back when they could just fly i i I grieved for him after their nerf but when they could just fly and didn't matter where i was i wasn't going to be able to get eight inches from all of them they were just going to randomly appear and eviscerate me that was that was tough having to follow the rules of the game and interact with terrain when they could just kill me whenever they wanted took a while to figure out how to deal with so if they have to charge like everybody else does, I feel like that puts fly where I want it to be. Agreed. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. I think some of the other news that they've released since our Monday podcast was that we no longer move. We reposition on the battlefield, which is very amusing. Mm. So we're flavorfully interacting with the rules instead of just calling it a normal move because nobody cares about normal moves, but repositioning that's hype. <laughs> what do we think dash is going to be? Are we gonna? Is it still oh, going to be a dash, or do you do we think there's going to be a different six syllable word that goes into a three inch movement? Little scoochie poo. Um, <laughs> dash. If I was going to rename it, whoosh. <laughs> peak. I don't know. Corner peak. Yeah. That, but you can use it for way more than that. Yeah. So I feel like the reason they renamed normal move was because i mean move just means so much and how many times i i can think of like half a dozen rules where i was like okay if i move i do this wait is that a normal move or is that a like a colloquial move that's a very Um, good point 
Yeah, disentangling some concepts is actually one of the things I'm hoping they move towards because I know when the original edition came out, a lot of people had questions around cover because we had cover, no cover, retain mm-hmm. cover saves, and also oh, I was like, oh my god, this is such a mess. And then there was a translation issues, so different countries had like the inability to use different words. So ceaseless and relentless in Spanish, I think, at the beginning of the edition were the same word. So some of the conversations online were fully insane because we could not even agree what reality was. Speaking of the difference between ceaseless and really and relentless, the commando boy also got previewed. The daca boy. And the commando daca boy, and he no longer gets relentless. Now he gets ceaseless. So that's a pretty big change, I think, to the commandos. So I'm hoping that you know this new edition doesn't have commandos somewhere at the top of the meta again and we've learned all the lessons from the last two years and these <laughs> rules weren't created at a time when commandos were soft little baby boys and needed a little bit of help i could only hope and dream the beautiful dream that the meta will be even and balanced and everything will be fair and good at the start of an edition I can dream that dream, but I can't begin to think it's going to be real. It's just too much to do. I don't need fair and balance. I just need fun and evocative. Welcome to the Wild West. Somebody's going to do some horrible, abusive thing that we're all going to be scared of. uh, Probably, I don't know, after the New York Open, which, uh, speaking of which, uh, shout out to that, which is happening on the weekend of the 26th of October, and it's sounding like that is going to be utilizing the new edition, most likely. Yes, we are 100% going to play on it. I added a writer to the website that says even if the game comes out on the 26th, we will bumpy ride the way through the tournament, and if everyone gets mad at me, that's fine, but I suspect more people would prefer to play on the new edition, scuffed and all, over playing one last ride on the old edition if the box comes out. Because I assume if product comes out on the 26th, the rules will have been out long enough through With all the preview different articles previews and from yeah. like websites and content creators that we should be able to get enough where we can run a tournament. It might not be perfect, but you know what? It sounds way more fun than one more ride on six point secure capture and loot after two and a <laughs> half years of play, right? Right, right. Uh, so which which tournament on which day was this that you uh, just spoke of? Uh, this is the tournament that I help organize out in New York, the New York Open uh, website will be in the podcast description, ny-open.com. Tickets are roughly $80, but New York's an expensive city, and we got to be able to pay <laughs> for the venue. And I'm really excited to run it for the third time, so if you can make it, Eric, come on down and get some practice. I, I will see what I can do, but for the sake of plugging one of Justin Duke's uh, events, he is looking oh, yeah. to run the Route 66 Kill Team Open on October 27th uh, oh, oh. in Sepulpa. Oh, so, you know, if you can't make it to New York City, you can come out to Sepulpa, Oklahoma. Uh, you know, clearly it's going to be one of those two options. There is no other place you would want to be that weekend. So that's 100 percent true. Yeah, new kill team, new game, new Wild West for us to play in. Can't wait. Oh, yeah. If you could have one wish for your Phobos boys going into the newer edition, what would you want out of it? I would like bolters to be able to hurt people. You don't want bolters to just be the background flavor of the universe the way they are right now in all of the 40k (laughs) related franchises? Yeah, I feel like, you know, with the fluff and the fact that they're being wielded by these, you know, you know, super science, superhuman, cybernetically enhanced uh, super boys that they should they should be harmful to normal humans sometimes. Yeah, that would definitely be something that I want. You know, maybe we'll get that. Maybe it might not show up in Kill Team 2024, but space marine 2 is coming out pretty soon and those trailers are looking pretty hype and the heavy bolter does look like it slaps in that i heard a rumor about that game or like a little behind the scenes uh teaser that it's three player co-op because having four lore accurate space marines was too much of a massacre so just to make it a little bit more of like a fair fight for the uh the bad guys it has to be limited to three what a vibe yeah, because somehow in Kill Team, we had to go from the Codex compliant five Astartes all the way up to six because they just couldn't hack it at five. They couldn't hang in there. 
Um, okay, now I want to answer the what would I do, uh, and I, I want to apply this to everyone. I want every single like combat knife to be a four or five profile. Like the if you if you give a blade to uh, to like an intercessor, four or five. In cursor knives, four or five. Scout knives, four or five. Uh, let's just let's just do that. the The knives are four or five. It would be nice to get a little bit more standardization for this edition. I think it would make teaching the game a little bit easier. And, you know, I think the hypest part about the new edition, at least for us competitive players and trying to bring our friends into the edition, is that it looks like there's going to be a lot more options for bringing people into the game. So I'm really excited about that because I was able to run a little bit of that at one of our local tournaments. We ran the prisoner scenario where the elder players basically taught two players all at once. And the co-op modes and the solo play modes definitely give me that sort sort of vibe. Like they tested it with prisoners. It seemed like it did okay. And they kept going with it. And they developed these new modes where they procedurally generate enemies. Although yep. I am kind of worried because it might be that some people come play solo mode. They show up to a tournament and they just have solo moded all the way incorrectly. And I'm looking forward to having to softly enter someone into a tournament scene who has very strong beliefs. Yeah, uh, speaking of which, I'm excited to see the new rules for Obscurity. Definitely want to see how that pans out. Yeah, the simplification that they can do with that and uh, how cover and concealment interact with each other. I can imagine just beautiful simplicity all around. I hope for it. Um, and then I also have to echo Travis's question back at you with, like, we'll, we'll switch it to Pathfinders or whatever team you want to talk about. What is the one thing that you are hoping for in the new edition for like a faction? I'm ability? hoping for my equipment to be a little bit more interesting. As much as I like the current setup of getting 10 equipment points, loading up single operatives to do some crazy stuff, I think generally there's too many static good loadouts or proper choices. And it's been a while since I've played a team or felt like there was a lot of reasons to switch equipment around, which I think is disappointing. So I'm hoping, and especially on Pathfinders, on Pathfinders, it's basically take a bunch of heavy marker lights, maybe take a, a climbing rope or two sometimes, maybe take a targeting optic. So I am hoping that if there is going to be different equipment and it's going to be maybe a global choice or maybe you like pick two operatives, get a thing, that they give us some more interesting choices so that we can have different loadouts. And hopefully the Doom Bolter strat doesn't disappear the way of the Dodo. Or maybe we get some more Doom Doom guys floating around because it would be nice to have a cute a cute little combo in a couple teams. Yeah, I'd, I would definitely be sad if Doom guy went away. I'm sure I wouldn't be the only one. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, they have mentioned that some stuff probably is going to go away. So for all our Compendium players, if you haven't seen on Warcom for some reason or online and some of the digital conversations, it does seem like they've called out that compendiums are not going to be getting updated. So whether that means that rules go away completely or they fully make it over into this edition and just don't get changed over, it's hard to know at this point because they haven't told us. But it does seem like for our compendium lovers who play demons and custodies, it might be that our time is is gone. <laughs> Or quickly approaching the end. So get your compendium games in while you can. And maybe GW will hear your pleas and they'll release some new models. Because if we are doing more jump packs, you know, maybe custodies have a, a jump pack in them for kill team. You know a what? A single custodies dropping out of the sky, <laughs> blast threeing his opponents in a spiral. <laughs> that would be that would be pretty hype. I don't know how many more opters you'd be allowed to have if that was a choice, but it would be kind of hype to get one big guy, maybe an assassin or two, just two or three models, just murder, murder spreeing in a kill team game. And you know what? Uh, a lot of people talk about Grey Knights. Grey Knights already have those interceptor teleporty like jump pack cats, and they could use a fresh kit. So if like they came to kill team, that would be super duper cool. Just those teleport pack Grey Knight. Whew. Sign yeah, up. we could get some. We get some more primary scaled gray knights or maybe not primary scaled because it seems like in lore gray knights are trapped behind the rubicon so they are stuck on firstborn status for whatever reason i don't know why but maybe if gray knights get a big it's update like, i think it's just like an excuse because they haven't made primaris yet and then they'll be like that yeah, one dude I, from the admic figured it out here they are. Yeah. You got your primary. Yeah, the, psychic, the psychics pass through the Rubicon. I mean, they could do it with the other Space Marines, so there's no reason why Grey Knights can't get Primarist. 
So who knows? Maybe Kill Team gets looped into that release if that ever comes around this edition. I know they did just release the Codex Imperial Agents, which souped in Grey Knights into the rest of the Imperial factions. But if Grey Knights get their actual Codex at some point, which they are slated to get from what I understand, maybe Kill Team gets a release and we get to upgrade them. Just like the Eldar models who are older than the Zoomers get a chance to uh, glow up in Kill Team, maybe. Yeah, I really like um, them using Kill Team to get out things that ought to be out and to and to hit things that we didn't know we needed, like like Felgor. You know, all of us need an angered goat man in our life, and we weren't going to get it through a conventional 40k release. But your Kill Team was to deliver us this beautiful gift. Thanks, Kill Team. Yeah, Kill Team's great. You know, got us new crew. The the precursors of the rest of the crew coming down the range for Tau. And they are fun models. They're extremely fun to paint. So the Vespid are looking kind of like that. It turns out my Tau army from the Farsight Enclaves is going to have just all the auxiliaries. I've already got humans in there. I got crew in there. And now I'm going to have Vespid finally. What a day And if anyone alive. else is excited for anything in the new edition, you know, make sure to ping us on Discord or patreon or youtube wherever you're listening to this well thanks for coming on eric uh it was wonderful to chat with you and uh your phobos outlook which is fantastic uh thanks for chatting with us about the rumors about the new edition yeah eric thanks for coming on thank you for having me it's been a pleasure and you all take care